Thank you, Scott, and thank you for living by example. Our next presentation is from LaToya Bond. LaToya is a suicide loss survivor. She's a legal professional, media host, author, and mental health and suicide prevention advocate. She is also a very valuable member of the Kevin Song family as a board member. Please welcome LaToya Bond. Good morning. Today, I'm going to share with you a very deep and personal tragedy that occurred in my life. I will be speaking to you with an open heart, and I hope that you will receive my message with an open mind. It's very difficult to stand before you with such a heavy burden on my heart, but this is a conversation that needs to be had, and we're here today. So, I want to start my presentation with a poem, because love is the thing that makes all things beautiful. The name of my presentation is called Speaking of Love. Love is the strongest magnetic force in the universe. Each time we choose love, we enjoy life more. Each time we choose love, we enhance the quality of our life. Each time we choose love, life seems brighter and clearer. Love heals. Love soothes. Love elevates. Love forgives. Love gives us hope. Love brings joy and abundance. Love makes us grow. Love makes life colorful. We are all here to learn about love, to love yourself more and therefore others. Real love is selfless and free from fear. It's joy in the joy of giving. Love more, because love is the thing that makes all things beautiful. Speaking of love. Before I go into my presentation, I would like to give you a little background information. I'm going to be talking about a murder suicide. I may be using words that are triggering to, to some of you. It's a very emotionally deep situation. So if at any moment, if any of you need to step away to get a cup of water, to take care of yourself, please do so. You can get up and just walk away if, if it becomes too heavy handed for you. Because my number one concern is you, the people who are here before me today. Three years ago, on the morning of March 2nd, I woke up in the middle of the night. My cell phone was exploding with messages, phone calls, voicemails from people in my family. LaToya, turn on the news. You won't believe what's happening in your family. And I want to share with you the news story that changed the course of the rest of my life. Well, tonight, family and friends are grieving over the loss of lifelong friends who rekindled their friendship and got married just last year, only to have it come to an awful end last night. Sterling Heights police are still investigating the deaths of Elizabeth and Herman McAlpin in what appears to be a murder-suicide. Jim Kurtzner, live at the condo complex where they live near the corner of 16 Mile and Shaner, talking with family and friends. And Jim... A lot of family and friends inside Broadcast House as well. This one hits close to home. It does, Glenda. And as the word spread, one word, shock. A neighbor found Elizabeth inside the front door here, then went inside to make the rest of the shocking discovery. They went in the house and saw, found him upstairs in the bedroom with a self-inflicted wound. Take a look at the happy photos of Elizabeth and her McAlpin at their wedding last May. 
They were friends back in the 1970s at Kettering High School. Herm even coached kids in basketball at this Southfield Rec Center. Liz and Herm went through their separate adult lives, had families, went through divorces. Fate would bring them back together just a couple of years ago. Herm's younger sister, Lexine, tells us they just made it through very tough times. Liz was with Herman as he fought prostate cancer and recovered from that. And they got married last year, May the 25th, on his birthday. And they seem to be very happy. He always talks about his beautiful wife. So this is just so hard to believe that this would actually happen. And Lexine tells us there were other health issues in the family, but nobody saw this coming. Herm McAlpin worked at Channel 7 until he retired in 2007. There's a lot of pain for a lot of people this afternoon. Reporting live in Sterling Heights, Jim Kurtz, 7 Action News. Certainly a shock to the system, uh, Jim, and we wish uh, him and his family and her family uh, all the prayers and support that they need at this time. Thank you so much. So, can you imagine waking up in the middle of the night to watch, to hear, to learn that the man you've known as your father your whole life, my dad, he was a wonderful person. My father was the first to go to college in his family. Born and raised in the city of Detroit, he developed a love affair with the game of basketball at a young age. And that love affair helped him earn his way as a sports star for Wayne State University. He was the shortest point guard on the team, but he could slam dunk the basketball with either hand. He went on to work for WGPR TV 62, which is the first black owned radio TV network in America. He hosted a sports radio show called Speaking of Sports. So when my father died, I knew that I had to do something to honor his memory. I don't know much about sports, but I know about love. And so the title of this presentation is Speaking, in Lo Speaking of Love after my dad's radio, award-winning radio program, Speaking of Sports. So how could a man with such a decorated career, he eventually left WGPR TV 62 in Detroit, and he started working for Channel 7 News, where he was a decorated employee for over 30 years. He won awards. He lived a great life. He was a wonderful father. How could this happen to someone like him? By all outward appearances, he was a happy man. He had a great life. This picture here is my sister and I, Tiffany. And my dad, we went to Friday's one day. This was, Friday is his favorite restaurant. Oh yeah, let's go there, I wanna go to Friday's. He was always full of energy, full of life. And at the end of our dinner session this day, he told the waitress, hey cutie pie, come over here. He had a way with people. He told the lady, he said, these are my two daughters, I want you to take a picture of us. And we positioned ourselves for the picture and he took his fingers, he said, here, uh, uh, kiss me, both of you kiss me. And then I want the waitress to take the picture. And two months after this picture was taken, he took his own life in a murder-suicide. And I want you all to know that um, I will not be able to discuss any parts of his wife's life. The couple had only been married for nine months, and I don't have permission from her family to talk about her. But what I will say is that she was a beautiful person. She loved my dad. She was in all four of his corners. When this happened to my dad, I didn't see it coming. No one saw this coming. But with suicide, as I learned from Greg, hindsight is 2020. Now that this has happened, I do remember the warning signs. The first one 
was depression. My father struggled with depression, feelings of unworthiness. He was actually under a doctor's care for mental health challenges. Alcohol abuse. My father loved enjoying the pleasures of excessive alcohol. E and J, he called it Easy Jesus. That was his, his weapon of mass destruction. He, he, after a long day, he would enjoy some easy, easy Jesus. We have a family history of suicide in my family. My father had a nephew that he was very close to at one point in his life growing up. He helped raise this young man. And the nephew passed away in the very same manner that my dad passed away many years prior to my dad's death. And I don't think my dad ever got over the fact that he wasn't able to save his nephew from the demise. My father also lost the best friend when he was in his 20s who died in the same manner. So there was a history of suicide with my dad. Situational crisis is another warning risk factor that I didn't notice. At the time of my dad's death, he had, uh, he had, get, just, he had just had the gastric bypass surgery, and he had lost a tremendous amount of weight. But his mobility was different. Being a former basketball star, now you're, you're mobile. You're not as mobile. You've got physical health challenges. All of that contributed to his demise, his sadness, his brokenness, his feelings of unworthiness. Career pressure. Working for WXYZ Channel 7 was the love of his life. He loved his job. But as he got older, and younger people started coming in, his feelings of inadequacy started to develop. He wasn't as tech savvy. He didn't know how to manipulate computers and things of that nature. So those were things that, that burdened him down. Giving away prized possessions. That was another thing I didn't know what that meant. My father had some very precious things that he started giving away at one point. And the biggest thing is my dad was a humorous guy, but he always made this one particular joke. When I would call my dad after a long day, hi, dad, how are you today? How was your day? Oh, I had a rough day. I'm looking for the bridge. Where's the ambassador bridge? Somebody take me to the bridge. And I would say, why, why are you looking for the bridge? And he would say, because I'm ready to jump, ha, 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 and we would laugh it off. But as I stand before you today, I realize he wasn't joking. He really wanted to jump. You are not alone. A suicide loss survivor often experiences a wide range of emotions. And I'm gonna talk to you all about my personal experience as a suicide loss survivor. Every person grieves differently. There's no right or way to grieve. We all grieve at our own pace. But from my personal experience, in the beginning, I felt shock. Watching the news story, I was just shocked. I couldn't believe that my dad lived on the opposite side of the news camera his whole life. And to be on the other end and for his life to end that way was completely devastating for the entire family on both sides. It felt like a dream. I developed severe sadness. I felt so guilty. Why, why didn't I save him? Why, why wasn't I there to help him? If I had been there that night, maybe things would have been different. I beat myself up. I'm embarrassed by what he has done. I was ashamed to take someone else with you. How could you do that to her? She didn't deserve that. What happened? I had all these questions in my mind. I felt rejected and abandoned. He took his life, but I'm your oldest daughter. I wasn't worth staying here for. What about me? Why would you do this? 
loneliness, suicide, loss survivors. We experience a depth of loneliness, loneliness like no other. I felt lonely in my pain because a lot of people turned their backs on me. No one really cared about my situation. They just wanted to hear the gossip, the story, the news story. Oh, what happened? What did he do? But nobody really took the time to see if I was OK. So I felt lonely. And eventually, I, suck in, I sunk into a deep depression. And I ended up in the hospital. For three days, I have been an independent, self-sufficient woman my whole life. And to be in a hospital where doctors were telling me, you can't go home, Ms. Bond, your blood pressure is extremely high, and we can't let you leave until we get your blood pressure down. And it was in the hospital, after those three days of being there, that I decided I have to turn my life around. My father wouldn't want me to die after him because there were moments when I wanted to die. I wanted a daddy-daughter reunion. Thoughts of suicide were prevalent in my mind. What's the point of living? People are going to judge me anyway. Oh, that's the girl whose father killed his wife and then killed himself. Look at her. This is, this is what I had to face. And I was ready to go. But I turned it around. And I'm standing before you today. I want to talk to you about 10 resources that have helped me survive as a suicide loss survivor. Every person's pathway is different, but these are some re really resourceful tools that I use to help me make it another day. Number one, seek professional help. Facing your grief alone will make the healing process much more difficult. Talk with someone. It can play a vital role in sorting out your emotions and your pain. Do not isolate yourself. With my dad, his funeral was on a Sunday, and three days later, we went into the COVID-19 lockdown. So isolation was very difficult because I couldn't go anywhere. I had to suffer in silence, being isolated. So if you can avoid isolation now that COVID is back, COVID is over and we're back into the real world, get out there, seek professional help. Number two, educate yourself. I knew what suicide was, but I didn't know the meaning of suicide. Educate yourself. Take a mental health first aid course. This education will help you along your journey of healing. Prior to my dad's passing, I knew very little about suicide, the subject of suicide. I've learned that suicide is a mental health crisis and it does not discriminate. Suicide can happen to anyone. Being a suicide loss survivor can be a lonely journey. But if you educate yourself, I joined Kevin's song. They helped me. If it wasn't for Gail and John's mission, I don't think I would be standing here before you today. I wouldn't. It saved my life. Number three, suicide loss survivors, we must engage in acts of self-care. Grief can be damaging to your immune system and overall health. Go to the gym, fix your hair, put on a fancy pair of earrings, order a nice cup of coffee, take, go for a walk, a fresh pair of pajamas on a day when you're just lounging around the house can make a world of a difference. For me, once a month, I take myself on a small shopping spree. I go to a local TJ Maxx. I allow myself a budget of about $25, and I buy little trinkets, nice little magnets or piece of ceramic, just something. And it's not so much 
the object that I'm purchasing is the 30 minute drive in the car, the open road, the solitude. It helps, you need that. Do not let your loved one die in vain. Number four, this is one of the most important ones. Please, no matter what, if you've lost someone to suicide, don't let them die in vain. Do not let that suicide be the last memory of your loved one. Become an advocate. Join Kevin Song and support other local nonprofits. Take part in media publications. Engage in podcast interviews. Participate in suicide prevention walks and activities. Be a voice for the voiceless. Turn your pain into a greater purpose. Speaking of love, be an instrument of love. Open your heart to spreading more love. People who feel love and people who have a lot of love around them are less likely to have suicidal thoughts. Participate in random acts of kindness. Help a neighbor with their grocery shopping. Bake a pie for your coworker. Call a sick friend and offer to do their laundry. Sprinkle love all around you like confetti. But most importantly, look at yourself in the mirror and say, I love you. I have to do that for myself sometimes. I'm very hard on myself. Sometimes I look at myself in the mirror and I find fault in different things. Oh, you've got a pimple on your front. No, I love you, Latoya. You're beautiful. And I have to often remind myself that what my father did, I'm not responsible for that. Suicide law survivors, we take on this responsibility that's not fair to us. We become responsible for our loved one's actions. But what we have to remember is that our loved one was sick. They're not responsible for the pain that we feel. If I, if I were to die from kidney failure, you wouldn't look at me and say, oh, she was so selfish. She died from kidney failure, look at her. You wouldn't say that because the kidney is an organ and it gets sick, right? Well, the brain is the same way. Our brains get sick sometimes. My dad's brain was sick. No human being in their right train of mind would take away a beautiful woman who loved him, who was in all four of his corners, who supported him through his alcohol abuse, through everything. A person who would do this is not well, they're sick. And we're not responsible for what, I've lo what our loved ones have done. Number six, allow yourself to feel all of the emotions associated with grief. As the doctor mentioned, um, the first speaker we had today, anger. I didn't wanna be angry with my dad. But when I changed my frame of reference and allowed myself to be angry with him for not only taking his life, but taking someone else away from her family, her grandchildren, her children, why would you do this? So I have had my moments of anger with him and I let his behind know how I felt. How dare you? He needed to know and it was it was, it was cleansing for me to let the anger out in that way for him. The shock, the bargaining, the denial, all of those emotions are real. All of those emotions are normal. So please know that you have to allow yourself to feel those emotions and it's a part of the process. In order for you to get better, and in order for you to step forth and live a quality life, you've got to go down that path. You've got to let yourself feel that. Writing a goodbye letter, number seven. This is very important because when a person takes their own life, 
They leave behind so many unanswered questions. There are things I would love to say to my dad that I'll never get the opportunity to say. I have emotions and feelings about what has happened. I'll never get to say. But writing a, a goodbye letter to your loved one, to let them know how you feel, what you loved about them. I loved all, everything about my dad. I was proud to have a father like him with all those accolades behind his name, a prominent man. I remember as a little girl, my father would come to pick me up and he would come in the Channel 7 vehicle and take me to McDonald's. Like, how cool is that? Like, none of my friends' dads did that. <laughs> they were electricians and plumbers. My dad was a news cameraman, okay? And I was proud to have a father like him. And I don't know if he knew, but I thought he was the smartest man I've ever met in my life. My father loved to speak in front of audiences. Like, I feel like I'm walking in his gift right now because he loved to speak in front of big audiences. Whether it was a funeral or a community event, he never had a problem going before an audience and speaking. So write a goodbye letter to your loved one. And when you write the goodbye letter, take your time and write it. But I also would like to encourage you to make a connection with someone that you trust, whether it's a family member, a friend, make a private appointment with that person and take your goodbye letter with you. Read the letter aloud in front of this person that you trust. And I would say take a box of Kleenex with you too. Read it in front of that person aloud in private. And then I want you to take the letter, fold it back up and keep it in a safe place. This is one very resourceful tool that you can use to help you along your journey of healing. Play music, number nine. This is something that I do quite frequently. Music has a fourth dimensional quality and it releases the soul from imprisonment. It makes difficult things seem easy to accomplish as a Detroit native, my dad loved The Temptations and Eddie Kendricks. He thought he was Eddie Kendricks himself. He really did. He would always sing Eddie Kendricks music. So what I do is I play music that my dad enjoyed and I just, I think of him and it helps me stay connected to him because I don't want to lose my connection to my dad. I don't. So I play music. I play songs that he enjoyed. He loved to dance. He wasn't very good at it, but he loved to dance. So I think that playing music is a good way to stay connected to your loved one. Tap into your cre inner creativity, number nine. Give yourself permission to express your imaginative powers and become open to happiness again. You deserve happiness again. Think about this. Do you think your loved one would want you to be hampered by pain for the rest of your life? Do you think that your loved one would want you to suffer for the rest of your life because they're no longer here? I don't think so. I think my dad would want me to be happy. He would want me to live and carry on a legacy of love. Open your heart. When you open your heart, you can do art, you can tap into making jewelry, you can paint on canvas, you can even make a, a keepsake honoring your loved one. Research shows that art can be therapeutic. I started making wooden door hangers prior to my dad's death. And it was a project that I kind of dropped and I stopped doing it because other things got in the way. But when my father passed away, I would drive to the local Lowe's and I would go right to the lumber department and I'd get a huge slab of plywood and I would take the plywood home, get my jigsaw, and I would carve out images and paint those images. And I wanna show them to you because these images that I'm gonna show you, they all represent a pill, 
a prescription, my therapy pieces. These, these items helped me with my grieving process. It transported my mind to a safer place. So this one here is, of course, Sesame Street. I took a huge piece of plywood and I carved out the image with a jigsaw and I traced it and I painted those. This one is more sacred than that one because this one, I think I made this one maybe three days after my dad passed away. And then this one, I tapped into my inner creativity and these pieces, I, I will never lose these, I'll never sell these. They're so sacred to me for the rest of my life. If I live to be 100 years old on my 100th birthday, I want these to be in my house. They mean a lot to me. They helped me live. This was my life support. It saved my life. I also published a book about my journey as a suicide loss survivor. The book, of course, is called Speaking of Love named after my dad's sports radio show, Speaking of Sports. Within three hours of self-publishing bo this book on Amazon, it became a number one bestseller within three hours. I never expected that. I never did this for fame, for fortune, for money. I did it as a way to cleanse my soul, to help me heal from losing the greatest man I've ever known. I wrote this book as a tribute to my dad because I want him to be remembered for the way he lived, not for the way he died. In addition to my book, I also co-authored an anthology with 20 other authors from around the world. The book is called Relentless and I am chapter 20 of that book. And the book chapter, of course, is entitled Speaking of Love. And it's a small version of my journey as a suicide loss survivor. This book here became an international bestseller within a day or so of becoming published. One thing about me, and I'm going to step over here when I say this, I love to eat. OK? My dad loved to eat, too. I grew up in a household where my mom and my grandmother, they were masters in the kitchen. And I inherited that from them. I'm a really good cook. For years, I've been baking, I've been cooking, sharing my food with people, making a pot of soup, take it to work for my coworkers, and people, oh, you, you're the best cook, you should write a book. So I wrote a cookbook. And the name of the book is called Please Pass the Love. You know how you're at the table and people, oh, can you please pass the salt? No, Please Pass the Love is the name of my cookbook. And I, this book was published a few months ago. So this book was birthed as a result of my dad, losing my dad. I tapped into my inner creativity. Another thing I've done is I've started a cottage home bakery where I bake delicious pound cakes from scratch, German chocolate cakes from scratch, apple pies, peach cobblers. <laughs> <laughs> food is love. I mean, I, food is love. That's my love language. It's not so much about the eating. It's about the serving. When I prepare a delicious meal, or if I prepare and bake a cake for someone, when I present that to that person, I'm not presenting food to them. I'm presenting love to them. It represents love. Number 10. Now, this one here is the most important resource that you can use along your journey of healing the loss of a loved one. Do something on a consistent basis to honor your loved one's memory. Let me say that again. Do something on a consistent basis. Don't just do it one time and stop. 
on a consistent basis. My dad loved radio TV broadcasting. It was his life. He loved public speaking. So as a way to honor him, I created a podcast in his honor. This podcast helps me stay connected to my dad through his absence. But here's the biggest thing. Every Saturday morning when I get up and I'm getting prepared for my podcast, it's like I'm on my way to a therapy session. I'm getting ready to meet and talk with people from all different walks of life all around the world on the subject of love. That, that was my therapy. That helped me heal and mostly stay connected to my dad. So I'm going to take a minute here and I'm going to play my podcast intro for you so that you can see where my healing began by honoring my dad. Welcome to Speaking of Love, the podcast, and I am your host, LaToya. I created this podcast in honor of my dad, who was an amazing guy. He had an infectious laugh, and his spirit was magnetic. He was the type of guy who made everybody feel like somebody special. If you were to place him in a crowded room of 100 people, my dad would be the smartest person in the entire room. He was an award-winning radio TV broadcast engineer for many years. Born and raised in the city of Detroit, he was one of the first to go to college in his family. And while attending Wayne State University, he developed a lifelong love affair with the game of basketball. He was the shortest point guard on the team, but he could slam dunk the basketball with either hand. By all outward appearances, my dad lived a rewarding life, but there were parts of him that were known to only him. On March 2nd of 2020, my dad's private struggles became public when he took his own life in a murder-suicide. When he died, a part of me died too. And since the tragedy, I have become an advocate for mental health awareness and suicide prevention. I also created this beautiful podcast in honor of my dad and others like him who are struggling with the effects of mental health challenges. My podcast, Speaking of Love, is named after a show my dad once hosted called Speaking of Sports. Thank you for taking the time to be here with me today as we take a journey in pursuit of the strongest magnetic force on the planet Earth, and that's love. So now I want to take this time to let you all know that if it wasn't for my podcast, I wouldn't be here today. I interviewed a young lady by the name of Jenny Landon on my podcast, and she introduced me to Gail Urso. And so I reached out to Gail and I asked Gail if she would like to be a guest on my podcast. And she, without a hesitation, said yes. So Gail, I want to take this time to thank you, number one, for being a guest on my podcast, but for also trusting me with your sacred platform here, Kevin Song. Thank you for trusting me and allowing me not only to be a speaker, but to be a part of your board, to be an ambassador, to serve on your committees. You and your husband have saved my life. Because when my father died, I wanted to die too. I'm, that's not just, those are not just words. I didn't want to be here anymore. He was the greatest dad any girl could ever have. When I had to have an emergency C-section with my daughter, he was at the hospital. When I got married, he walked me down the aisle. He was wonderful. He was always available morning, noon, or night. I could call him, and he would pick up that phone. And if he was, if he was going somewhere, he'd call me first. Hey, I'm going to be going over to Fridays with my friends, and we're going to have some fun. And I, I won't be home, but if you need me, just call me. He was always there. 
So Gail, I thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I just want to say to each of you that everyone's journey is different. I've taken a lot of paths to get here today, but I'm woman enough to stand before you and say that it's still a struggle. It's only been three years, but I still struggle with the internal battle of standing before you saying all these wonderful things about a man who ultimately took someone else's life. Do you know how hard that is? It's, it's difficult because I feel like I'm doing him justice, but there's a whole nother life that was taken by his hands that I have no power, no control over. It's very difficult, but I'm doing it because it needs to be done. I'm standing before you because I want my voice to be heard. And if I could help one person, then my work is not in vain. Speaking of love, this is a path I never thought I would take. But I'm here today to tell you that if you allow the love that you have for your, for your loved one to motivate you, to push you, you can survive this horrible, way that we have to live now. Please speak of love. Everything that I've told you today is important, but you have to find your own way. There's no right or wrong way to heal. Do what works best for you. Love is the strongest magnetic force in the universe. Each time we choose love, we enjoy life more. Each time we choose love, we enhance the quality of our life. Each time we choose love, life seems brighter and clearer. Love heals. Love soothes. Love elevates. Love forgives. Love gives us hope. Love brings us joy and abundance. Love makes us grow. Love feels good. Love makes life colorful. We are all here to learn about love, to love yourself more and therefore others. Real love is selfless and free from fear. It's joy in the pain. Love more. Love is the thing that makes all things beautiful. Speaking of love, and at this time, I would like to open up the floor for questions. If you all have questions, I'm here to answer them. Does anyone have questions? Don't be afraid. If not, oh yes, there's one. I do. <laughs> I do sell my pound cakes. That was her question. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> um, I'll, give you, I'll give you the information on how to do that. Was asked to go to the microphone. Okay. <laughs> to say, do you sell your pound cakes? I do. I do sell my pound cakes, and I can give you one of my cards if you'd like to purchase one for me. And then I also sell my desserts at the Guardian Building in downtown Detroit. So there's a little store on the first floor, and the, the store owner lets me sell slices and things like that there. I, so. I work in Detroit, so I'll stop by. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you all. Oh, yes. Latoya, yes. it's been a while since I've seen you. In fact, a whole year. Well, yes. not quite, as I think about it. In the fall, I saw you. At any rate, I want to thank you for this wonderful program that you gave us this morning. 
Thank it was you. terrific. And I have to say, I can attest, I've gone for a while to a few of the sessions in Gross Point uh, that uh, Gail and her husband sponsored uh, that are every other week, Gail, mm -hmm. every other week at, at Gross Point. Group? Yes. That's, that's what it is. So I went to the ones in, in person, and I have to attest to her baking. She would bring the most wonderful chocolate chip cookie. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you all very much for allowing me to be here. Thank you, LaToya. It was wonderful getting to hear you speaking of love. We're now going to take a short break, and we'll be back in 15 minutes 